Welcome to Colorado. I'm Chef Bob Sargent of Savory Cuisines Catering. Join me for a culinary adventure. What is Colorado cuisine exactly? I'm not sure that I know. We take our influences from the spicy Southwest, barbecue from Texas to Kansas City, the healthy cooking of California, Vietnamese and Asian cuisines which have come to Denver, and of course the fantastic flavors of Mexico. Let's get started. Now we're in the kitchen and we're gonna start with a couple roasted chickens. We're gonna do some root vegetables. We're gonna just do some basic techniques and um, get some things rolling that we can use in some other menus later today and in uh, future episodes. So we just gently smush the garlic and then the skins pop right off. And we're gonna be using these to marinate our chicken before roasting. Not even just marinating, but kind of rubbing it. Um, use just a couple cloves for each chicken. You can see they just come off very easily after that. All right, this should be good enough. <laughs> that in the bowl. Then we're going to zest a couple of lemons. And you don't want to get too much of the white in there because that is a has a really bitter quality to it. So you just want to get the actual zest. I use Meyer lemons because they're readily available right now in the winter time. Um, and they just have a nice, subtle lemon flavor, not so astringent. Get up a simple screen colander. You can even, if you can't get all the juice out, you can just rub it right against the, the mesh. A little of olive oil. Probably about a tablespoon of salt for each chicken, and we're doing two. These are about a, just over a teaspoon. You can add more salt later. And f always fresh black pepper. If you don't have a grinder, um, you can buy a ground, but it's just much more fragrant when it's freshly ground. You can use less. And then we'll just place the chickens in there. You want to open up the skins a little bit, get some of the marinade, get it inside. Okay, so you try to get as much of the marinade into the chicken as possible, and then we'll get it ready for the oven. So I will change my gloves, clear out some things out of the way. Get ready for the next step. All right then. So these chickens are friends, so they have to stay together the whole time. That's so they came together, and so they're gonna they're gonna keep each other comfortable in the oven. Here we go. We we'll get them over. And one of the things that I like to do with the chickens is, so these wing tips are gonna burn on you. So you just want to tuck them in. Uh, a lot of people trust their chickens. Um, sometimes you can just use a rubber band if you have it left over from asparagus or something. I think it's fine just leaving them apart, but I'll show you a little other trick that I learned a long time ago. You can poke a hole in the back of the chicken and you could stick its leg in there. So we'll do them two ways and that's it. And then you just tuck the other leg. I'll put it over here so you see it better. And then I'll just tuck the other leg under this leg, hopefully not tearing the skin because then Oh, look at that. There we go. There's a trust chicken 
tuck the wing flaps back here. This also allows for the breast to be cooked more evenly without anything in the skin to be perfect. So we're gonna put that chicken on there and then we have all of this left. So you can just pour it inside of the chicken and you can even use a little bit to rub the outside. Just a little bit of extra salt on the skin. And cracked black pepper. These are gonna go in the oven. This is a convection oven and we'll temp them because they're, they may cook at different times. But I have it at 400 and I put them in with the fan facing the back to hopefully cook the dark meat faster. And in they go. All right, now the chickens are in the oven. We're just going to prep our root vegetables. We're just basically make a meal today. In that meal, as I said, we're just gonna do some fundamentals that will give you a good starting point to make other things in following episodes. So always keep a sharp knife. We'll keep our scraps here. You can use a lot of your scraps for stock, but I wouldn't suggest using skins or lemon peels. Uh, both things can make it a little bitter. Also, um, just peelings off vegetables can work, but we're gonna trim these up a little bit so we'll have plenty of vegetables for stock. Some people use a peeler like this. It works pretty good. You can see it's fast, but it gets all clogged in the peeler. So I was just always trained to go like this. We have some parsnips as well. We have some nice root vegetables. Some people like to peel all at once. There's different ways to uh, skin a cat, as they say, but there's also different ways to peel a parsnip. And then we have turnips and rutabagas today as well. We will get to how to prepare those. And this is our friend, the rutabaga. It's good to trim it up a little bit before we start, and I'll tell you why. So we're gonna take the ends off. And then you have a good starting point for your peeler, because these things are not fun to peel. Some people uh, roast them and then peel them. I prefer to just come done, be done with a finished product. So when it comes out of the oven, we're ready to eat. I've even seen people peel beets and then roast them. Uh, I think the general consensus is to roast a beet and then peel it with a damp rag. And then we have our lovely turnip. Also, same thing, same principle. We're just gonna trim off the ends. Um, not everyone peels turnips, because they have that lovely color. As you can see, when you peel them, you lose that. So what we're gonna do is these were scrubbed. They may not look that clean, but um, they are. So we will peel one and we will leave one with the skin on so you can see the difference, see which one you prefer. I've always just really loved cooking. Uh, when I started out, my mother cooked every day and she wasn't always happy with everything she cooked, but I always liked it. But um, again, she just gave me really good principles on how to prepare certain things and gave me a good jumping off point to then I went into first started cooking uh, Chinese food and things like that because they just weren't available in my household or even there are very limited amount of ethnic restaurants in my hometown in upstate New York. This little turnip is a little soft. It's not perfect in there. We're in the, we're in January. Oh, it's a goner. Luckily we have two other good ones. And then we'll do the final rutabaga. I think the important thing is people don't like peeling things because it takes so long. But if you just keep your hands moving and take little strokes, you really will get through it. You'll watch people that are just 
just keep moving. Let the peeler do the work. This is uh, for potato eyes and stuff, but you can definitely use it in here. You could poke it around. Um, but you know, you can also just cut it off, probably faster. And you can, when you're, when you're chopping them up, you can definitely, much faster with a knife. People peel ginger with a spoon. I just use a knife and trim off the parts that I don't want. Something else is a nice tool to have is a bench scraper. This will speed this process up tremendously. Always be mindful with your knife because if you have a sharp knife and you even just bump into it, you could cut yourself pretty badly and then you'll be late for dinner. Won't need any garlic, move it aside. So there's a couple cuts that you can do. As I said, we're gonna use some of this for stock. I'm gonna get out the seeds and undesirable things. So we will discard this little end. And this is something called a roll cut or an oblique cut. And something to keep in mind is we have four different vegetables of different sizes. So, but to make them roast consistently, we will try to chop them the same size. So, start with this. And you can see the, the parsnip gets much thicker. We're just gonna take off a smaller piece each time. Some people put parsnips in their stock, some people don't. I think they're just fine. Um, they're just a white carrot. They have a slightly stronger flavor. But then, you can see those are pretty consistently sized. Move these to the side. And then the carrot is smaller. So the first one, take a piece off for stock. We'll take a bigger one and a bigger one. And then it's pretty uniform all the way down. And the last one, I just cut it off and cut it in half. Um, if someone criticized you that, that one isn't the same shape as the others, they shouldn't be at your dinner table. So this one, so again, we're in the winter with turnips and uh, these ones were a little dried out. So I soaked them in water last night to rehydrate them slightly. See, we're slowly getting the same shapes. On to our friend, the rutabaga. Again, something that I always tell young cooks and people who ask me things is try to work with a flat surface. If you try, if you take a sharp knife and you try to cut something that's wobbling around, you have a much better chance of hurting yourself. And then again, no dinner. So maybe that one's even too thick for you. So you just, again, put it on a flat side. And on to our final turnip. You may not want to look in the camera when you're cooking if you're just starting out, but it's always practice. I'm still practicing years and years later. You can always get better at cooking. That's one of the beauties of it. I started playing chess during the pandemic and you can always get better at chess. Cooking is very similar. There's lots of techniques, there's lots of things to learn, there's flavors, there's combinations. It really is a lifelong thing that you can enjoy. Feed yourself, feed your friends. Nourishing people is one of the most satisfying things you can do in life. Back to the principle of having everything made, sometimes I will put my olive oil in there. I would say for this many vegetables, let's say about six cups, probably use about a half cup of oil. One of the things is, and you can add more salt later, but a couple tablespoons to start, maybe a tablespoon and a half. Um, you don't want to over salt it, you can't take it back. And also, if you have too much oil in here, it's no big deal because we're gonna lift the vegetables out of the oil. You start with your basic vegetables and then work into meats or whatever. You're not gonna contaminate, that way you don't have to wash everything every time you touch it. Sometimes I'll chop garlic in there. Sometimes it's nice just to let the vegetables have their own flavors because they really are, I think less is more. As a young cook, and I see this with young chefs, they always want to add chilies to this or garlic to that or uh, infuse this and that. And I, when I meet chefs who have been working for a really long time, 
They just want to highlight the natural flavors of the vegetables, of the meats. They don't want to overdo it or mask it with anything. And everything looks uniform. As you can see, there's no like big spots of pepper, which also give you an indication that the salt is evenly mixed through. Then we can put them back in their first bowl. And you can see we use just about all the oil. But there is some salt and pepper in there. Um, and because it's very little, it's mostly salt, I'm gonna put it back through. Along with the chickens, I have pre-warmed the pan in here. And we'll take that out. And, oh, our chicken friends sound happy. And then you just give them a little shake. And right back in the oven. Okay, let's get back to some basic cooking things. We're gonna start with a nice chicken stock. Um, when the chickens come out, we will trim off the meat, throw the carcasses in here. You don't wanna start with hot water. My understanding is that the little pores in the bones of the chicken or whatever, uh, they will seize up if you start right in hot, hot water. So in the cold water, uh, more of the flavor can come out. It's just a theory. I'm not sure, I haven't tested it. Um, but this is just celery. I had used most of it that I had uh, left in my fridge just for this purpose, because it was getting a little tired. So we're just gonna chop that up. I've already thrown the scraps in from earlier. Um, again, I have this carrot that nobody wants. <laughs> so it's a wonderful stock carrot. You don't have to throw it away. It's not rotten. It's just a little dried out. I mean, you could. You can give it to your friends if you want. It depends on how good of friends they are. I had the parsnip left over, so I'm gonna use that as well. Because as I said, I'll try to use everything, an onion, I'm just gonna cut them a couple times. And there are ratios to this. Um, you can look them up on the internet and whatever, but I made a lot of chicken stock in my life and it doesn't really seem to matter. So, then we'll take our little bowl. I like to slide my cutting board to the edge so I can get about half of the bowl under the board so the widest part of the bowl is right underneath me so I don't miss much. Again, like I said, we can discard some of the skins. Go in there with our scraps from earlier. Um, you can add thy, uh, thyme, bay leaves, peppercorns, anything to stock you want. Uh, lemon zest, lemon juice, uh, curry powder, cilantro. Depends on your application. You can really pre-season your stock and get a head start. Also, you can make it really basic and add things later. So parsley, I've already rinsed this parsley. I always check the parsley. You put your fingers in there, rub them together, and you can feel if there's any dirt. There's often dirt in uh, parsley and herbs. So I'm just gonna use this for later. But what I want, I don't need a twist tie in my stock, but I want these stems. And then for trimming the parsley, I will just go through it a few times and look for any big stems. I'll pull those off. It is just as good as food. Um, I'm just not concerned about the presentation. If there's a couple stems in there, it doesn't have to be perfect. We're cooking at home. And if you have a family or anything, you, you don't have time for all that. So you just do your best practices. Uh, and again, Parsley is another one of those things. You can look up if you keep your hands out of the way. As I showed before, you can really crunch up the parsley and get it all at once. But this was a particularly bushy batch of parsley and I couldn't really control it, so. And you'll be really happy. There's so many applications we can do with those roasted chickens. We're gonna make stock with them. Um, you can turn that stock into chicken noodle soup by pulling some of the chicken apart, throwing it in there with a little diced carrot, peas, onions, celery, 
and a little spaghetti. And I mean, it could be just leftovers, leftovers, leftovers. If you had leftover pasta from a different meal and it was just a little bit, it'd probably be the perfect amount to put in a soup. So we're good with that. And then we are going to put this aside and start on a basic rice because so many people, even in the professional kitchen, when I used to give a chef test, if I was gonna hire someone, people would come in with these resumes and they had worked here and there. And I said, great, just make me basic boiled rice. And they'd say, well, how do you want it? I was like, I just want basic boiled rice. Do you want it in the oven or the stove top? And I said, I, I don't really care. Um, I just want a nice rice. And they constantly, I mean, it's so basic, but people just freaked out. I watched chefs who had incredible resumes just shake at the prospect of making a simple rice because it's one of those things that maybe your sous chef makes or maybe you use a parboil or maybe you don't use rice in your restaurants a lot. So it's this simple. I'm gonna grab my rice. I keep it in this very, very nice container. I'm gonna go one cup. And for a family, you can get about four portions out of a cup, depending on how many people you have. If you want leftovers, you can have a little bit more. So maybe I will go a cup and a half for this. And again, it's not science, so, but you want to be close. So that's about a cup and a half. Move this side. And then it's going to be two to one, three cups of water. Again, I used a little bit of extra rice, so the extra water that spills over, when I measure this, it's gonna be perfect. Um, I put a tiny bit of oil in there, not a much, just to help keep the grains from sticking. And a, per cup, it's about a teaspoon of salt. Turn it on high and we're gonna keep an eye on it. You can boil it for a while because when you put the lid on, if it's boiling, the starches are gonna to start to bond with the water and it's gonna spray out and you've seen it. You'll get uh, rice all over the stove. It's kind of inevitable. It's worth it to have perfectly cooked rice. When also when it starts to boil, we could throw it in the oven for 22 minutes and it would come out perfect. But I wanna show you the stovetop method uh, so you'll know. So I keep it uncovered, keep an eye on it. Don't ever stir it. Once you cover it, don't uncover it. Uh, that's really important. Um, people always wanna peek at the rice and then they realize they're like, oh, it didn't come out right or it's gluey or whatever. And I was like, because after it's done cooking, and you turn it off, it needs to steam. And then the starches will settle and rest. And then the rice is really easy to fluff and serve. Um, we could have made a pilaf, added some chicken stock, added diced onions, celery. Again, just like the stock, you can do anything with the rice you want. Curry powder, bay leaves, uh, you know, uh, very English buttered rice. You could put butter and salt in there and that's amazing. So. We'll just wait on that a second and we will check on our chickens. Normally I would do this in the stove, but I want you to be able to see it. Here are our chicken friends. And you can see they're touching. Um, they won't be touching when they're done roasting. But if you think about the shape of the chicken, inside the bones are kind of like in a V. They come together in the front and they kind of spread out for the cavity. And you want to temp them here. so. This will be up down, side down for you, but you can feel it run against the rib cage, and that's the coldest part of the chicken, and I like to take that to about 155 degrees. You could see now, or maybe you can't, it says we're at 77. It's about two degrees a minute. If we're trying to get to 70 more degrees, 35 more minutes in the oven, usually at 400, it's about an hour and six minutes. I can't remember. These are about a three and a half pound um, chicken. So we're at 77. You'll want to clean your thermometer because it was just in there raw chicken. But you could see they're happy. And the one that we trust when the skin got hot, it broke. So um, let me see. 
Another trick we can use is I have the rubber band from Celery and you can. So you have to twist it once to hold them together. But our chicken is back trussed. Um, the rubber band at that temperature, I think rubber melts at like 700 degrees or 1000 degrees or something much higher than your oven. Um, so we'll put that aside. We have our chickens. I checked the vegetables as well. They look fine. I would say the vegetables in a standard oven with convection, probably 19, 20 minutes. Without convection, maybe 24, 25 minutes. You had about 20, 25% um, without the fan. Okay, so the rice has just started boiling. It'll get pretty, pretty feverish pretty quick. And then, as I said, you can see the starch is starting to form, form little bubbles. They will get much worse uh, and bigger as we get going on and it will overflow. So one of the things is you're going to turn it down, way down. So this is the lowest my oven will go. I often feel like that is even too much flame as it goes. So I go a little past that where it almost wants to go out and that is fine. We just watch for just a second here. I'll keep this as clean as possible. So hopefully you can see in there too. Also, grease cleans up really easy if it's hot. Like if you have a stainless steel coffee pot or a, a pan or anything, boy, look at, they shine right up when they're warm. You just take a damp rag, you don't even need soap. There's a simple quick trick to keeping your stuff nice and shiny. So if I turn it up a little bit more, the starches haven't come out of the rice yet. So you're like, oh, I'm, I'm good, I'm fine. And you'll walk away and it will boil over and you'll be sad and you'll have to clean your whole stove. Sometimes you can just vent it and it will pick up. It's amazing the amount of heat and temperature, even though you've turned it way down, you will double the temperature inside just by covering it, by holding that heat in. Um, even though uncovered, you might not feel that much heat here, the heat you're trapping in is, is really uh, substantial. So I'll just turn it up a little bit. Hopefully we'll get a little more of the starches to start forming and I'll show you what I mean. Okay, you can see the bubbles starting to come up on the glass now. They're getting bigger, which means that any minute now, it's going to want to boil over. You can see, uh, here it comes. So you just, you can vent it a little bit and then you know you can really turn it down. Here's a fun little thing that a chef taught me. You find yourself a fancy champagne cork, you get a cake tester and then you just poke them. So if you look, that's really resisting, not done. Carrot, really resisting. Turnip, the turnips cook a lot faster, especially because I said they were pretty soft anyways. So you could pull the turnips off now because they're done, but the parsnip, the carrot, and the rutabaga are not done. Um, I don't feel like sifting through all the turnips, so they're just gonna get a little more roasted than their friends are. Um, at this point too, you can even stir them because you'll see there's oil on the bottom and they're getting a little dry on top. It's time and temperature. If you leave them straight in the oven, they'll cook a little faster. If you take them out, it's not that they're gonna stop cooking. They're just gonna take a little longer because we've cooled them down slightly. Shake them back out. You can see the rice now is boiling over. It's uh, and again, this is where I, you know, you could just take a quick vent um, back to the same thing. This is gonna be really messy to clean up. So if you're not afraid of the flame and you have a damp towel, you can just wipe off some of the stuff that trickled out. It'll be a lot easier to clean up because when it gets cold, it will set up and even rinsing it in the sink will be very difficult to clean. I think everything should be done now. And first thing we'll do is the vegetables were calling to me. They were screaming they were done. So we'll take a look at them. And here we go. Take our little handy dandy tool. You can see how easy they all press through now. So those are done. Again, we can toss them one more time and get them in a bowl for presentation. But I think our chicken friends are done as well. Uh, so, a couple things you can do with the chicken. Let's say you didn't have a thermometer you go to an hour and 15 minutes, I guarantee it'll be done. Also, you can just look at the skin. All this burnt stuff, you don't want to eat that. You can just take it off. Um, 
but it did whatever oils were in those herbs and uh, garlic and lemon will be uh, in there. So push that back, like I said, at a slight angle. It's coming through. Looks like we might have been in there just a little long. Looks like we're at 158. And then this bird right here, it's saying 142. So this one cooked faster than the one that was tied up. And that is because, I'll show you why. Because as I said, as I had it back towards the fan, it was able to cook the inside of the bird, which cooked it from two sides. This trust bird probably is gonna take a little bit longer, um, but we want everything to be perfect as perfect as possible. So, get a platter. And we will, now this is gonna be very upsetting to the other chicken, but one is done. So at 141, we probably have just like eight more minutes. Um, and there we go. Now we can take a look at our rice. It's also been resting. You can see it's just a light steam. Uh, if we pulled it off and it was heavy, heavy, heavy steam, that means that it would still be steaming the rice. The grains have relaxed. Always use a fork, um, a two-tined fork. A pair of chopsticks works really well. They don't stick together that way. And then you can just get a really light and fluffy rice. So that's done. And then we will, usually you'll let the chicken rest 10 to 15 minutes before cutting it. Um, but I want to get a little quick presentation for you and show you what we're doing. Now, when the roasting of the vegetables, you've concentrated their flavors, their sweetness. As I said, I tried not to add too much salt. They're actually really nicely seasoned right now. This pan is essentially nonstick. This was formerly a steel baking pan, but after years and years of using, um, it got a nice, I think I called a patina on it. And that is just like a cast iron because it's metal and not aluminum. Um, some carbon is built up on it. Makes for a really nice nonstick pan. I just throw it back in the oven and then I'll scrape off any dried bits. Okay. So then our friend, the chicken. And I'll show you why you always want to give it a minute to rest. Need a couple of gloves. Because when we cut into this chicken, we're going to lose some juices. It also might be a little messy too. So make sure we have a cleanup towel ready to go. Pick up the chicken. First, we're going to do, we're going to dump out some. That will alleviate some of it. So it's on the platter. And then you can use either knife. If you're not comfortable using a big knife, you can use a smaller knife. And you always want to approach any kind of a bird, turkey, anything, and you want to carve from the back. You can, see, you can feel right in there the bone. You're just going to go next to it. You're just going to cut down and then you can find the other side of the bone you're going to cut down put a little leg up there we'll take the wing off right at the joint when they're cooked nicely just by twisting it gently you'll see where the joint forms and then you can just cut through with no real problems at all a couple slices you can see the the joint right here you're just going to go in front of it Cut the skin, keep it all together. You can see the chicken is starting to lose some of its juices. We're not gonna get in the thigh right now. You can use a serrated knife. That knife didn't seem quite sharp enough to get through my skin without cracking it. I didn't want that to happen. And then from here, again, another reason why I want it to rest is it's awful hot, but you can just pull it. Once you cut that first piece, you can just pull it down, find out where it goes from there, and then the chicken has done all the work for you. So now you can just pull it off, pull it off, cut it down where it wants to go. Like I said, it's very hot, so you definitely want to let it rest. If you don't know your way around the chicken well enough, um, 
you'd be pulling too hard and you'd definitely get burnt. And then the last bit, then I'll show you something else. I'm gonna use this towel, because this part is really hot. Again, you're pulling off. You can see this bone pop out and you are just gonna cut on the other side of it. And it is done. Same with this side. We're going to pick up the carcass. We pull this down. The bone ex exposes itself. And then right in front of it, boom, and it's free. Your whole chicken is cut. Everything left on there now is ready for stock. Um, these are called chef snacks. This is pretty important. This is the best part, I think. You just pull that off. Mm. And then there's something else that lots of people know about, but not everyone. This is the convergence of the white and dark meat, and it's called a chicken oyster. And this is literally the best thing. You don't get it at the restaurant. If you're working with a real chef, you don't get it because it is a snack. You can see it. It looks just like an oyster. It looks like a little smoked oyster. Mm. What also makes that perfect is while it's cooking, all that lemon, the garlic, the salt, the pepper, it's just settling right down on this oyster. So this little guy is the most flavorful little piece on the chicken. And that's mine too. From there, we'll just pull off any meat we can, pull off the, the legs. What I do, I like to just take it right now, get all this meat off while it's hot. But you can also just push down, clean, one bone here, Oop, again, backwards, bones out. Um, there's a second small bone in each leg, just like in your own leg. You wanna make sure you get that. Um, piece of cartilage, that's it. Now sometimes the carcass, because I have the pot pretty full with vegetables, is going to be a little big. It's gonna wanna stand up. So then, um, there's even ways to do this. There, it still will come apart for you without dulling your knife. Um, you can just pull it into pieces and then uh, just hit it at its joints and the chicken will come right apart. Maybe, maybe I'm not. There we go. Okay, so then all these pieces. will just go in our stock. Like I said, we can use this for soup, sauces, really anything. All these juices are super flavorful. They have seasoning in them. They have lemon essence. So don't waste anything. Now, we'll just put it on the stove. I have a pot filler. And we'll turn it on high till we see it start to simmer. Then we'll turn it on low and let it go for four hours. From here, we will plate our chicken friend. Two cuts on this breast. Now we'll put it back. We would have, uh, if I was in a restaurant or something, I would have used the leg in the presentation. Okay, now we're gonna plate the chicken and make a quick, simple vinaigrette sauce for it. So we're just going to get about a tablespoon of Dijon. I have some apricot preserves here. About a tablespoon of that as well. I'm just gonna try to break up any whole pieces. So that's about a tablespoon as well. What those do is they will help the emulsification process. A little bit of balsamic vinegar, probably about an eighth of a cup, and then a little parsley, a little garlic, quarter teaspoon of salt, and then I'll 
show you another quick trick. You can take the towel and you can spin it. Then you roll it and you tuck it under itself and it makes a very nice place for your bowl to sit. When you get all of the apricot preserves and the Dijon and the balsamic mixed together, it will already look a bit syrupy and then you'll just add a little bit of oil at a time to get the emulsification going and that's it. You can see the oil is fully incorporated into the Dijon and the vinegar. Put that aside and now we will finish. Take this plate. Everything build towards the middle. Everyone thinks when you see a plate built in a restaurant and it looks like it's compartmentalized it's out on the edge, it always starts in the middle. People have different size plates and they'll do slightly different things, but I'll show you what I mean. We're just going to take a little of this rice and we're going to throw it all over the place so we can have something to clean up later. And our veggies. So we'll just fluff it over here. We'll take some veggies. We're also going to push them. We're going to fight for the center right now. We're just going to put them on top. And you can see that we're already out to the edge. Then we'll fix our skin for presentation. We're going to take this, this guy. We're just going to lay it right across the middle. Again, right in the center. And where did our hand it end? So then we're just going to put our vinaigrette over. It should be pretty sweet and pretty strong. Everything else is seasoned pretty well. You can go around the edge. If you want to look really fancy, um, and you have a steady hand. You can do a little drizzle of olive oil and there is a chicken plate, that simple. So just for fun, we'll do a little, we'll call it the Parsley Bay. We'll do a little, you know, I think my friend says Poofy Diego. I think that's his magic word. Um, and there you go. You have way too much parsley on your chicken. <laughs> Here's our stock working. It'll take about four hours of simmering. Here's our dishes today. We have a simple um, stovetop rice roasted root vegetables, our chicken dish with a little apricot balsamic vinaigrette. We have our beautiful roasted chicken here that you can use for tacos, anything you want. Next time we'll be making a pan seared pork tenderloin, a little blackberry demi-glace and some green beans that we will blanch and saute with a little garlic. <laughs>